is filled with all kinds of stuff. And increasingly, we're realizing that the way in which we design and make stuff is exacting a huge cost on our planet and on our society. But we're also realizing that there are some emerging technologies that will totally transform, potentially, the way in which um, we manufacture things. And so what I'd like to share with you are three technology trends that are at this, these early stages that may change everything. So the first one is called digitized reality. And that's the capacity to take snapshots of the real world with the computer to be, create a digital model that's intelligent so that we can create better stuff. The second is infinite computing, and that's to harness the power of cloud computing so that we can improve those digital models to create better stuff. And the third one is perhaps the most surprising, and that's a trend called rapid fabrication. And rapid fabrication is an emerging set of technologies that literally allow you to build or print three solid three-dimensional objects from those digital models. And so these technologies actually aren't new, but what's happening now is that their performance has increased dramatically while the cost has decreased substantially. So we're at this um, tipping point. That's a great word. I should write a book on that. A tipping point. <laughs> of this emerging technology. So what I'd like to do is to share with you um, some, uh, the, some details of, this, of these trends, but also speculate about what they mean for us in the future. So, digitized reality is all about the capacity to create some kind of um, uh, intelligent representation in a computer and modeling the world. And the reason this is important is design begins with some conception of how the world and the objects inside of it behave and operate. To get that into a computer has traditionally been a slow and laborious and time-consuming process because um, the designer had to bring that stuff into the computer. So why not use some kind of technology that would automatically bring that uh, picture or snapshot of the world into the computer? And that's exactly what these devices do. This is one class of them, there's many others. These are called 3D scanners, and this particular one here is called LiDAR, which is kind of like radar. And the way it works is by sending out a beam of light to an object and then measuring the reflection of the uh, beam of light back into the computer, and it produces this three-dimensional uh, model of the object, in this case a house, uh, that can then be manipulated and digitized. So the state of the art now is rapidly transforming and changing. And um, so this is a model of a ship, not the Titanic, but a reasonably large ship that's been scanned in literally a, a couple of hours. And it's what's called a point cloud. So there are literally tens of millions or hundreds of millions of points that represent the entire object, exterior and, and interior. What's happening now is that the computer technology will allow us to extract information and identify the objects, the surfaces, the solids, even the properties of the objects inside of them. And it's dramatic because what it does in a relatively short amount of time is it creates this rich digital model of, of this uh, object, which you can then manipulate and do stuff with, improve upon the design. So digitized reality is important because it creates an accurate model of the real world. So now that you have a model, what do you do with it? Well, you can harness the power of the web to do improve design. Now, before we actually go into infinite computing, let's talk about, uh, remind ourselves about the, the design process. So design is not linear, right? It's not a straight line. That's really the essence of it. It's a cyclical, iterative uh, process where one explores ideas and then analyzes them, explores and analyzes. So you come up with an idea and then you do some testing of it. You come up with another idea and test and back and forth and back and forth. And Sir Ken Robinson likes to say that creativity is an alternation between speculation and judgment which is exactly what's happening here. So, enter a computer. Now that we can have a digital model, the computer will allow us to have a richer and deeper conversation of the sophisticated model. So, what this is now looking like is something like this, where a computer can calculate all of these parameters, sustainability, material shape, functions, and cost, and actually produce a range of design options. Literally in the background, it calculates a wide range of what is the optimal design of the thing that you're trying to create. So what designers really strive to do is not create one loop, but a ton of them.
endless loops, and to do that as quickly and intelligently and really as playfully as possible. So computers still take time. They're fast, but they're not as fast as we'd like them to be. Uh, so to run some of these simulations might take, well, for example, 10,000 seconds for one computer to run some of these simulations. So here's where infinite computing and the cloud come in. So what if we had not one, but 10,000 computers doing the same calculations? working in parallel. And that's exactly what the cloud allows us to do, to do the same amount of work in one second as opposed to 10,000, several hours of time. And so what's interesting here is that the calculations um, cost the same. So for example, you say you're an architect and you're working on a building and you'd like to explore the alternatives of, of a building. In the background, the computer, with 10,000 computers working in the, in, in the background, can simulate the performance of the building. It's thermal properties. So as the designer plays around, let's try this shape, let's try that shape, having the conversation between design, between speculation and, uh, and judgment, the computer calculates the parameters and uh, uh, what the, compu what the uh, building is actually going to look like. And it produces a tremendous amount of data that is useful to creating uh, a planet that is sustainable. Uh, the, I think the interesting thing here is that it really doesn't matter what computer you have, whether it's an iPad or a new netbook, um, as long as it's connected to the web, um, we can harness the power of infinite computing. Okay, so now that we have a great model that's been scanned, what's next? Well, we want to produce that, uh, a physical representation of the model, and that's where rapid fabrication comes in. So these are rapid fabrication machines. This one cost uh, about $400,000, and this one cost about $500. Doesn't do as much, and it uh, uh, doesn't look as good, but they work in the same principle. It's something called additive manufacturing. It's also called 3D prototyping or 3D printing, where layers of material are literally deposited upon in, in some kind of surface. So let me show you some exa examples of the results of this machine. This is a, a rapidly prototyped shoe sole, running shoe sole, and it's made up of rubber, and literally it's printed, and this one takes about uh, 20 minutes or so to print out. Okay, let me show you something else. This is a machine part here. This is a battery casing that opens and closes. This is really my favorite that I brought along. We just printed this recently, and it's a series of gears. And this can't be manufactured otherwise, in any other way. And it's insanely cool, to quote somebody, um, because there's no other way to build this stuff. And it's incredibly intricate and incredibly powerful. So, I've shown you examples from plastic, but the real revolution is that this stuff is now being printed in a variety of materials, from metal and fabric and stone and even glass, and about two or three materials are being added now every month, lower cost, and it becomes really quite powerful. So we can manufacture locally and inexpensively, but the real interesting thing here is that complexity is free. Your laser printer doesn't care if you print out a picture of your dog or a Beethoven sonata, and neither does this 3D printer. It can produce a really rich, intricate model of anything that you design. It costs the same. So, digitized reality, where you scan stuff, infinite computing, where you can um, improve upon it, and then rapid fabrication is a, an approach to making stuff. And I like to call this scan, modify, and print. Now, you might be surprised at where scan, modify, is print is appearing in the world. So this is a rapid prototype of a hip joint. Scanned on one side, made improvements inside of the computer, printed out and inserted functionally into a, a, into a person, dramatically improving the, the quality of their life. What about something larger? This was done about three and a half weeks ago in the booming metropolis of Winnipeg, Manitoba, my hometown, um, and it's a rapidly prototyped car. Not everything is, 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 is 3D printed, um, but all the exterior and even the glass is. Okay? This is an XPRIZE finalist, and I don't remember the exact uh, amount, but it gets up 700 miles per gallon. It's just crazy.
This is a, a, a visualization of a four-story concrete printer. And so what this does is the gantry, as it deposits its layers of concrete, it produces a three-dimensional object, a three-dimensional building. And so remember, complexity is free. So it doesn't have to be a cinder block. It can produce any kind of shape that is responsive to the environment, that has the kinds of parameters that you've calculated for free on the web uh, using these infinite um, uh, uh, computation. So remarkably powerful, and so the University of Southern in California already has some of this technology in places, robots that literally climb on top of each other. So uh, I just wanted to put this in. This is a, a, a scan modified print in the world of art. Any thoughts on what this is? This is cool. This is the, the path of a moth flying around a um, flame over 10 seconds. So it's been digitally captured, recorded, and printed, and, uh, and it's hanging in uh, many museums uh, around the world. So the question is, is this stuff really real, or is it a hobby? And so, <laughs> is this really going to transform the question? And I think that's the question. Um, and I think one way, to think of, one way to think about this is to look at the progression of technology over time. It generally begins in the world of the impossible, where uh, it's not going to be uh, uh, ever likely to possible, to expected, to required. So when Leonardo envisioned flight, it was a dream. And today, of course, it is a requirement. That's why many of us are here. So these technologies are now rapidly moving from the domain of the just possible to expected and beyond, and it's happening really fast. So what uh, is going on? So this is some technology that we launched about a week ago of um, kind of like LiDAR scan, but it's free. It's done with digital photographs that you take uh, literally with an iPhone or a cheap digital camera, and then harnessing the power of the web, it produces this rich three-dimensional sub-millimeter accuracy mesh of uh, uh, this, this particular person. Um, and so it's, it gives you remarkable fidelity and quality. Um, this uh, a buddy of mine just emailed me, which I just uh, videotaped on my iPad a couple of days ago, a model of a shoe. Hmm, you see where this is going. What if we'd be able to scan, modify, print coffee mugs and computer parts and shoes? Where is that going? Give it up for the shoe, will ya? <laughs> This is a technology, uh, it's called Maya, it's software that was used in the making of uh, Star Wars and, and, and Avatar and many others, and uh, some software I helped bring to market some years ago. Now here we've modified it so it works at the molecular level. So literally you can model the quantum properties and the Vandermeer forces of uh, various objects to create and design and manufacture at the tiniest levels. So this stuff is real and it's happening now, and you, these are some of the machines that uh, we're, we're working with and, and designing, working with a number of organizations. Why would you want to do this? Well, because there's a new generation of printers, including this one here from a company called Organovo. And what does it do? It uses an HP print jet or an inkhead jet to print out cells. Deposit individual living cells, stem cells, or in this case, blood cells. And the first model of the printer actually prints out um, blood vessels to replace um, uh, blood, so, <laughs> it's, it's going <laughs> further. Um, so, what about this? This is a rat rapidly prototyped ear with uh, differentiated cell stem cells that are on, on top. So, this is where it's progressing, and where it might go is something, someplace like this. This is just an artist's conception. This isn't really it. So, just a prototype. This is going to be, I think, the most revolutionary technology of them all, and this is the one that, uh, of all the pictures that I'm showing you, this is the one that blows me away the most. This is Andrew Hessel, and he's a co-chair at Singularity University, I also teach there, um, and he t studies bioinformatics. So he's holding three by five index cards, and on the cards you can barely see his little smudge of yellow. That's, that smudge is of DNA, and printed on the cards are the properties of the genes that are encoded onto that card. Those cards are given to uh, high school students in a competition called iGEM, which stands for International Genetically engineered machines. And so these high school students are given tasks to perform, um, to create a form of life that performs a particular task. It, for example, change the color according to the kind of light 
hmm, duplicate photographic film. And by the way, the solutions that they produce are actually better than today's best photographic film because it's a biological process and so much more. It's just such an interesting competition. Um, this is part of a trend called DIY bio, which should stand for do-it-yourself biology. And to, uh, today, they say that DIY bio is where DIY computing was in 1975. Hmm, and that's evolved somewhat. So programming in the future may look something like this, where we are producing the parameters and the code for stuff to grow. So rather than um, creating the, uh, this is wood, so I, I think it's wood, um, uh, the, you know, a tree that you grow, chop down, 100 years, um, you grow a seed that grows into the shape of the table. So impossible, right? Yeah, it's impossible. Where does it go from there? So the implications of this are really quite amazing and staggering. We're moving away potentially to a model of um, where elite designers put their designs into a um, factory where material is brought from all around the world and then we all get the same stuff to one in which an individual either creates or licenses the intellectual property of, of a design and then prints at uh, a local Kinko's or a Home Depot or at one's own place because these are going to drop to uh, the price of laser printers. Truly, they went down from 200000 to 5000 to under $600. They'll be $100. Um, and you get to get the stuff that's, that's important. Is this really important? Well, customization, I believe, is incredibly important. And one of my favorite examples is from Bespoke Design, uh, Scott uh, Summit. He scans people's legs and produces um, uh, prosthetics. Uh, that are elegant and beautiful and make a design statement. So no longer do these individuals have the experience of a mother walking by and saying to their kid, don't look, don't ask. And instead the kid runs up and goes, is that ever cool? Tell me about it. Can I have one? And so this is an example of what some of this design looks like where we have, you can't tell where the prosthetic starts and also where the, the motorcycle begins. So I think the transformation is uh, really going to take place when we go from here to here, which is where one rapid prototyping machine can produce another rapid prototyping machine. <laughs> because we know where that leads. And uh, right now we're about 85 or 87 percent the way there. It's quite far. So imagine the possibilities, imagine where this is going to go. What this means for us is that design, I believe, will be more democratized. More people will be able to do more designs around the world because the technology will be cheap, easily available, and people will be able to uh, create the things that are important to them. So we have this insanely great tool set that's emerging, but the real question is, do we have the mindset? And that is the real question, that's the call to action, which is to, um, return to what I think are the most important and powerful aspects of design, which are the old, timeless values of does it do its job? Is it functional? Is it beautiful? Does it delight the senses? Does it tickle our sense of, of the world? Is it responsible? Does it respect the environment and the people that we're designing for? And then is it elegant? In, in Polish, there's a word, smacznego, which means the delicious part of deliciousness. And, uh, and so, is it, does it have that magical thing where everything just fits together in just the right way? So, now that we will be able to build anything, what will we build? And that's the question that I believe um, we are more and more people will be entering. We're entering into a phase of unbridled creativity where more people will be able to create more stuff that's more relevant and important to uh, uh, them than ever before, and I think that will be an amazing story to be told. Thank you.